Are you going to start the introduction or? Yeah, yeah, I already started and I'm starting without actually any introduction. Here is uh, Judge Cass Sunday um, again. And although we're friends, good friends, but still today I'm going to call you instead of Cass, I'm going to call you Judge. And why is that? You I know why. All of us, why? <laughs> I'm, I'm going to tell you what I tell a lot of people. There are only two people that call me judge without calling me by my first name. The first person, the first uh, group of people who call me judge are the ones who forgot my name. And it's easier <laughs> just to say judge. The second group of people who call me judge and something by my first name, usually you're looking for a favor. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, then I'm the third category. The third category. Because the reason why I'm gonna call you judge instead of your first name is because today you're gonna be telling us very interesting stories from your experience sitting on a bench court. So yes, I, I tell you, you, you actually started this. You said so people asking you because they're curious, you know, you're sitting on that bench and you're saying you need to do this, and you're questioning, and this is the verdict, right? Yeah, people, people are always interested, and it's always the war stories that people find the most interesting. Of course, um, I know the when most we last... drama, the most yeah. the biggest drama, right? It's, it's kind of like the, the um, I, I forget what they call that, um, when they do the Netflix and stuff, the editor's cut, or the editor's version. Well, they'll explain why this happened instead of that happened. So hopefully, hopefully people will find it uh, entertaining and enlightening. And, uh, and we'll hopefully see. we're going to learn something from it. Hopefully you learn to have a, a good sense of humor and you'll, you'll really um, enjoy the segment. So, all right. So without further ado, um, I, and of course, if there's a question, feel free to interrupt me at any time. It makes the conversation go. I'm going to be like a good student. <laughs> and I'll, I'll call on you. Let me just mark your name down so I don't forget. Grajena. Okay. <laughs> so I, I guess. Tell you, I tell you before you start, today is my kind of law and justice day. I just made a video in Polish and was about that kind of, uh, about mm -hmm. the different situation in Poland. But yeah. then I realized I have a meeting uh, on Zoom with you and I'm saying like, is this, uh, you know, justice and law, law and justice day? <laughs> I guess something is in the air. See, if I would have learned Polish when I was a, a child, I could have helped you on that video as well. Unfortunately, the Polish I did pick up growing up in Wallington is not suitable for um, most companies. <laughs> Usually so. that's what people learn. Okay, what's the most, what's going to be first? The most shocking, interesting, or what's the first story about? Well, um, you know, when I, my first year, and I've been on the bench, this is, I'm finishing my 14th year, if I remember correctly. The first year I says, oh my God, I can't believe this happened and this happened. I was going to write a book. I said, you know, nobody's going to believe this. This is so funny. This is so strange. This is fill in the blank. By the time I got to my second year, it was like, oh, yeah, I heard that before. Oh, yeah, I saw that before. You know, and it's it's kind of um, played itself out. And I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, well, maybe there really wasn't a book <laughs> in me after all. But, um, you know, I think it's, it'll be helpful if I uh, kind of explain what the functions are of a municipal court judge, at least in the state of New Jersey. Basically, we handle all moving violations, and that goes from, you know, parking offenses to driving while on a cell phone to drunk driving. It also covers um, criminal offenses in New Jersey, and criminal offenses that are handled in municipal court or anything that's punishable by six months in jail or less. So they're basically called, uh, you can think of it as misdemeanors or non-indictable offenses. You know, if it's more than six months, it has to go up to superior court. And then the matter is either adjudicated in the superior court or they downgrade it to something that's punishable by six months or less. And they bring it back to, to the municipal court. The third thing um, that's very big um, part of our job is tempor temporary restraining orders. And when Superior Court is not in session, usually it 
8.30 to 4.30, Monday through Friday, um, they'll, they'll be there. Um, otherwise, all other hours, especially 3 a.m., 4 a.m., it goes to the municipal court judge. And that's typically where uh, there's some type of relationship, a um, dating relationship, a former dating relationship, a, um, you know, a, a marriage relationship, um, a family relationship, uh, mother versus son, uh, father versus son, whatever. And what happens is we, we, we listen to the testimony under oath. You, it's almost always over the phone because it's almost always at three o'clock in the morning. And based upon the testimony, we see if it meets the criteria for a restraining order. And I'll, I'll talk about it a little more in depth when um, uh, I'll, I'll talk about it in one particular case that comes to mind. And uh, so we explain that. And the thing that's really the most amusing or entertaining for me as a 63 year old bachelor is performing marriage ceremonies. And I think I've, um, when we used to have in court sessions now since um, the middle of March, uh, everything has been virtual. But I used to do uh, two, three, four uh, marriage ceremonies before each court session. And if you multiply that by um, two sessions a month times, you know, uh, 12 months times 14 years, plus the ceremonies I do outside the courtroom. Um, it's, I think I last calculation was between 650 and 700 marriage ceremonies. So you can imagine there'll be some amusing stories. Yes, Grace. Yeah, the most amusing story is that the people you marry don't ever get divorced. No, they just apply for temporary restraining orders. <laughs> yeah, or they die, but they don't go for a divorce. No, that's really something. Well, I, I thought I had a perfect record, and I used to tease my parish priest, and I'd say, you know, Father, not for nothing, everybody I've married is still married. And then six months after doing this, uh, the first one got divorced and another one. And actually, Grace and I met uh, via a, a marriage uh, ceremony. Um, one of Grace's um, good high school friends, part of the three, three Grajenas, the three Graces, um, came to court and I had performed her marriage ceremony. Well, it lasted at least a year. And a year later, um, she, uh, the couple, Grace and her husband, had a, a celebration over at the local um, uh, Krakowia Club, the Polish uh, Hall. And I, I was uh, kind enough to be invited, and that's where I met Grace. She mm -hmm. looked the same. I, I've aged <laughs> about 14 years since then. But um, oh my God, it's unbelievable how long ago that was. It had to be at least 13, 14 years ago because um, I've been on the bench 14 years, and I don't know if it was the first or second year I was on a bench that um, Grace, uh, and know, I married. think that was the first or second year that I actually held the Bible that you swore. In. Yeah, correct. It's, you know, it's a, it's a strange how you, the universe brings people together and then shifts them out, and people come in and out of your lives. The sad uh, postscript to uh, Grace's friend is she passed away. How many years ago now, Grace? Do you know offhand? Do you remember? Oh my God. At least uh, six, seven, huh? Yeah, I would say so. Minimum six or seven, minimum. So um, it is what it is, but uh, she's fondly remembered by um, Grace, myself, and a whole bunch of people who knew her. So that, that was Grace. So that's the most, uh, that's the best part of the job, the marriage ceremonies. But, um, you know, when I was a uh, kid, my dad was um, on a police uh, department in my hometown, which is where I'm the municipal court judge also. And he'd come home on more than one occasion and he'd tell my mom, get on your hands and knees and thank God you have a normal family. I got a little older and he's repeated that a few times and I finally said, come on, dad, you really think our family is normal? And to my surprise, he says, yeah, we are. Wait till you see what's out there. Being on the bench for 14 years, I've had the opportunity to see what's out there. So um, if, if you're blessed to have a normal family, give thanks for it because uh, it's not a guarantee. So that being said, um, when, I was, when I, I was first getting sworn in, I, I had the opportunity to listen to my predecessor, whom I knew very well. We actually went to high school together, and now she's in Superior Court, the assignment judge for our county. 
and she, she made a remark. She says she was grateful for the position because it had, gave her the opportunity to be a positive influence on other people. I said to myself, you know, what kind of, you know, positive influence could you have being a judge? You listen to a case, you set a fine, you know, you, you find them innocent, you find them guilty. Uh, you know, I didn't, I thought it was more cut and dry and, and by the book, uh, but I did realize, I did come to realize that you actually do play a part in other people's lives, not just the happy part with the, with the marriages, but also with the restraining orders, um, you know, with, with some criminal matters and such. And I'd like to share um, one or two of those uh, stories uh, with you. Um, the first one that comes to mind is um, I got a phone call very early on to set bail, which is something the municipal court judges used to do um, in the last year or so. They've taken that function away from us and, and assigned it to, um, for lack of a better word, the presiding municipal court judges in the central municipal court. Anyway, I got a phone call at about 3 a.m. and the police said, the judge, we need to set bail on this. So this individual was caught, caught in um, you know, uh, uh, the, um, a yard where they had you know, trucks and stuff and um, the witness saw him and they, he threatened the witness with a tire iron and made it sound like this rough, tough, you know, a criminal element, right? So I said, oh, okay. I got out the, the guideline book for um, that particular offense. And I looked what the, the range was and it went up to $50,000. So I said, oh, I'll give them $50,000 for, meaning they have to come up with a full $50,000, not a 10% option where they could come up with maybe 5,000 and, and get, you know, a bail bond. Um, so, that was on a Saturday, actually Sunday morning. We had court the following day, Monday. Back then we used to have it at 6 p.m. So he retains an attorney and, and the attorney comes in and says, judge, I'd like to make an application to, to reduce this bail. I said, okay, you know, he presented his case and the door opens up and here comes the sheriff, the two sheriff's officers marching in the prisoner. Well, this poor kid was a little over 18 years old. He must have been five foot nothing. I think the uh, oversized orange jumpsuit he was wearing from the jail weighed as much as he did. There he is in shackles. I said to myself, there's an important lesson for you. Not, you know, your perception may not always be the reality of the situation. And the attorney says, you know, very sorry judge, you know, Apparently, he had a few drinks and um, had beer muscles, for lack of a better word. And his family was willing to, to you know, put the house up for the bail and this and that. And he, was, you know, he was a resident of the town. So I said, you know, I don't think that would be necessary. I believe I reduced the bail from $50,000 to $500. And um, so he was happy. The parents were happy. The attorney was happy. And um, I think we all learned the lesson uh, from that. You know, I think uh, for the defendant's uh, lesson is rear muscles aren't the same as real, mu real muscles and, you know, question things that are, you know, spoken to you at three o'clock in the morning and delve a little more deeply into the, the facts and circumstances behind it. So that was, um, that definitely had a positive influence on that young man's life. Uh, so he, he was able to um, stay out of jail and, and we worked out a plea bargain and everybody was happy. Grace. Uh, uh, thank you. Sometimes it freezes for a second. That's why I have to uh, see you, you know, again talking. Okay. But it's okay. Okay. It's all, it's all good. You mentioned bail, how mm -hmm. it really works and what that means. Because if you say 100,000, you mentioned that to put it down is only what, 5, 10%? Yeah. Well, for the, the function of bail is to ensure the defendant shows up. So I could put a hundred dollar bail on, or I used to be able to, this is no longer the case, but I used to be able to put a hundred dollar bail in, and sometimes they couldn't make that. But the whole purpose of bail is to make sure that the, the defendant has some skin in the game where it is, if he doesn't come back to court for the, on the next court date, um, we could revoke that bail and um, put a new bail on him and continue that process until the whole, um, uh, the whole trial or the whole uh, 
procedures or you go, go through. Very rarely do we actually have a trial. Um, you know, uh, most, most of the um, things get settled via a um, uh, plea bargain where the, the defendant or the defendant's attorney will meet with the prosecutor and say, all right, he's charged with this. Could we make it a borough ordinance so he doesn't have a criminal record or could we reduce it to something else, a disorderly persons or petty disorderly persons? And then we work out most stuff because if we had to have a trial on every matter, we kind of would back up the courts. And sometimes, you know, the best, uh, uh, the best justice is to come up with a plea agreement where everybody is, is satisfied. But there's an old saying, I think, in, in the civil practice, a, um, a um, bad, um, oh my goodness, um, a, a bad settlement is better than a good judgment. Meaning, okay, you're a uh, adversary parties, and I think the case is worth a million. You think it's worth nothing, and it's we nothing say, okay, I'll tell you what, give me ten thousand dollars on a civil matter, and we'll call it a day. And you say to yourself, you know, 10,000, I didn't, I didn't think I did $10,000 worth of damage. And I'm thinking, well, I was worth a million. But guess what? That 10,000 in my pocket very often is better than a judgment for a million dollars, which I may never see a penny of, you know, coming from grace. So um, same thing with the, the, the plea agreements and, and criminal matters. Um, okay. Thank another you. time when I had the opportunity, oh, the you. pleasure was mine. Another case where I, I'm kind of surprised I had a positive influence on, on, on the lives of um, other people. It was the last court session before Christmas a couple of years ago. And halfway through court, again, the door opens up and the sheriff's officer is marching three prisoners in their orange jumpsuits and shackles um, on their feet and then on their uh, hands. And when that happens, I like to keep a quiet courtroom, but when that happens, you could hear a pin drop. Everybody's like, oh my, this is serious, you know, and it's everybody's like, they have full attention to everybody. So anyway, the three um, prisoners were sitting on the side of the court and guarded by the officers. So the first one, and we like to get, you know, stop everything and handle the prisoners matters before we continue with the parking offenses. So the first one comes up and I say, all right, what's, what's the story here? Well, Judge, um, I'm in, um, you know, I, I can't make the bail. I, I have about $100 in outstanding fines and such. And I, I, I really can't, you know, afford this. I'd like to have a time payment or I'd like to, you know, do something, you know, so I could get out of jail. So I said, all right, how much is it that, you know, we owe, you owe? And it was $100. And I said, all right, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. It's Christmas time. You know, I could give you a, a lesser amount or a time payment, but you're still going to have this over your head. And you knew they hadn't worked in a while and you knew they had no prospects to, to work. So I said, all right, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to convert the, um, the, you know, the fines to time served and whatever's left over, I'm just going to vacate it and you're free to go. Well, he was ecstatic to say the least. The two gentlemen that were sitting there waiting for their turn are grinning from ear to ear. Each of them come up, and the reason they're grinning is they each had fines outstanding. That was less than $100. So I said, all right, you heard what I told the other uh, gentleman. Yes, so I, I vacated everything for the other two. And I said, listen, use this as an advantage. You're not going to have to come out worrying about the first $100 you earn going to you know, um, the, the town or, or the government, you know, you're, you're really starting with a fresh um, slate financially. So take advantage of it. Fast forward a couple of months later, I'm in the local 7-Eleven standing in line getting a cup of coffee. And from the back of the line, I hear, hey, you the judge? Well, when you hear that and you're not with the court officer, it could go either very well or it could not. Thankfully, I turned around and it was one of the three gentlemen that were the prisoners that I vacated the fines for. And he actually thanked me for that opportunity. And he says it was a big plus not having to come out worrying about, you know, making these time payments and, and really getting out from under the rock. So that was one example that I felt, you know, I, I could actually do some good for somebody. And that's a good one. That's a good one, Judge. But here is the question. I don't know I'm why listening. it came to me now. 
did ever happen, considering that you have a court security, you have people who are watching what's going on, right? Yes. Uh, did ever happen that someone started a problem in a court, like yelling, screaming, acts of violence, ever? Well, you may not tell by looking at me on a screen, but I'm six foot four, 300 pounds. So even without court security, I don't usually get, I was, I will say this though, I was in um, another court. I, I used to sit in for a couple other towns and this one town was a, a fairly large city in, in the county. And when you say all rise, when a judge walks in, it's not for my purposes, it's the respect for the position, okay? Well, there's this young man sitting there with his hoodie on and didn't want to be bothered. He wasn't getting up. So I didn't say anything, but the court officers, the policemen from the, from the town um, walked up to him and told him, well, first of all, they had a row of people sitting next to him. The police officers made everybody vacate the, that row and stand in the back. They walked up on either side of him and says, you have to stand up and you know show respect to the court. He refused. <laughs> They, they picked him up, one on either end, and stood him up. And, you know, I told them, I said, you know, it's not for me, but it's, it's for the court that you're showing this. And they start, you know, escorting him from the court. And he's yelling at, judge, you see what they're doing to me? You see this? You see this? And they weren't manhandling him. They were just escorting him out. I said, well, all I really see to tell you the truth is you're a contempt of court, and contempt in the face of court. You're, you're showing disrespect. So long story short, um, uh, towards the end of the court session, they brought him back in and he apologized. And I, you know, I explained to him, I said, listen, uh, you, you're not doing this for me. I, I, you know, I understand you're not showing me the respect, you're showing respect for the, the position. And you know, it's, he understood it and he accepted it. And you know, the, uh, there were no additional fines and there was no contempt charges or anything like that. So. I think I think he learned a little more respect, uh, or at least for the two police officers that had escorted him out. So yeah, um, that's probably the closest I've ever come. We did have a, a case where um, in the in the uh, prosecutor's office off the um, off the courtroom, one of the uh, defendants got verbally aggressive with the prosecutor. And they called the police in, and this was a big guy, and um, it took about three officers to, you know, get him down and handcuff him and remove him. Turned out he was my neighbor, um, a couple years older than me, and he was apparently had bipolar issues and was mm -hmm. off his meds. And since then, he's come back two or three times, very, you know, um, gracious and thankful for the opportunity to be in court and not in handcuffs. And so it's. Um, that's probably the closest I've come to um, some, some uh, outbreaks in the court. I remember we used to, um, uh, I used to park my car like a block away um, from the courthouse and they'd have one of the, um, this was an auxiliary policeman uh, walk me to my car. The kid, I'm six foot four. This, this guy was about five foot two maybe and about 85 pounds soaking wet. So I'm walking next to the curb and he's walking on my left side and I stopped and I thought I said hey, do me a favor walk <laughs> between me and the sidewalk so this way if somebody comes by at least I'll be able to see you uh, because I was just like an eclipse when he walked to my side people wouldn't have seen him but it wasn't needed but uh, it's, it's still nice to have um, the escorts to back to my car. So I have a next question. That's knock on wood. That's maybe as I get older and more infirm, <laughs> maybe somebody will think about it. But so far, so good. The other time, um, can I can I ask times, you something? The, the next time that, sure, of course. Judgment, because that's kind of when you're saying, okay, this is the bail, or is this or that, whatever the judgment is. What is the main thing? to accomplish for the law and justice, and on the other hand, the lessons. So somebody is not like, oh my God, this is horrible, and the judge is horrible, and the law and the system, there's no justice in this world. And 
somebody receiving a punishment, but at the same time, actually learning something. Good. Well, wouldn't it be great if we all learn from our mistakes? Unfortunately, not everybody learns from their mistakes. Um, and sometimes it takes a couple of mistakes to, to learn a, a lesson from it. As far as the, um, you know, being treated fairly, um, they, they really, um, the Office of the Administrator of the Court uh, basically instills on us the need to not just be fair, but to give the perception of fairness and impartiality. And one of the reasons um, judges wear black robes goes back to the tradition of being neutral. You're not playing any favorites or any sides. And um, you know, sometimes I, I understand the defendants would say, hey, you know, the prosecutor works for the government, you work for the government. You know, how fair of a shake am I gonna get with this? And I'll never forget one time I had a case of trespass in the local high school. And the defense attorney found out I was a graduate of that high school. And um, long story short, he, you know, he, he thought twice, like, hey, am I going to get a fair shake? Well, it was, what happened was the mother came into the, the school um, because their, her daughter had been involved in an altercation. And um, long story short, I found her not guilty of trespassing because the, the, the school did alert her. She wasn't like she just came in off the street and there, there was extenuating circumstances. I, I found her not guilty. And I, I think even the prosecutor was pleased with the decision because not every person that, that's charged with something you know, should be really um, prosecuted, but they start the process, you get a ticket, or you get a summons, you have to let you know, um, uh, nature play its course. You have to let the, the, the wheels of justice you know, move forward. And hopefully you know, they um, do the right thing at the end of the day. But, but, uh, but you know, yes. I wanna say, uh, let's say the prosecutor, right? We have the prosecutor and the other side that's trying to advocate for whatever, whoever. But isn't like prosecutor when they say they introduce their case that they should be 100% really certain that they have all the facts against this person? Well, the standard um, for, for criminal offenses and, and for, you know, is beyond a reasonable doubt. So unless you were there and you witnessed it yourself, there's no way, or you, unless you had a video of what happened, and even then, sometimes videos could be misleading. You know, there's no way you could say with absolute certainty, so and so did such and such. So that's why it's beyond a reasonable doubt uh, for the criminal charges. Um, but it's it's interesting. You can't, you know, if it had to be with absolute certainty, the jails would be empty. You see, you mm -hmm. see, here we're getting somewhere. Well, but <laughs> I, I, I mean, it goes. You know what? You you may absolutely, and you have a right not to agree with me, of course, and I wouldn't be surprised if you didn't. But if I was today a president, most likely I would let eighty percent people out of prisons. Well, I don't know if that's the number, but. Suddenly, we know that whoever was incarcerate, incarcerated, am I saying right? In course. Many, many years ago. Now, if we stand up in the front. Incarcerated. Do you hear me? Yes. Uh, now, if came back to a court, I wonder. With looking with the new evidence, because we used to didn't have this, this, and the other thing, you know. Now, yeah, like you said, you even on a camera, but how you truly, without any doubt, say that this is it, that's the person. Well, if you if you um, follow the news, sometimes you'll see so and so spent 20 years in prison for a rape or a murder that he's contends he didn't commit. And what happens is um, they'll retain whatever evidence. So 20, 30 years ago, I don't, I don't know the number offhand, there was no such thing as DNA. But now with the DNA, you know, um, they have special 
um, rural projects. I think one is the Innocence Project, where they'll take up uh, cases where you know the the, um, the prisoner proclaims his innocence, and there are certain facts that would you know question whether or not he was guilty. Well, they they retain DNA evidence, and they compare that to the prisoners. It doesn't match. And you'll see they, you know, their convictions get overturned and they're set free. It's, um, it's really sobering to think about, you know, what you, uh, putting someone away for 20, 30 years and it was the wrong person. So this is it's one a thing. serious business. Yeah, um, this is one thing. And the other is, I think more and more, more people realizing that even OJ Simpson, in a criminal case, got out, right, free. Then in a civil case, he was convicted. So if you have money to have the best lawyers, <laughs> you go possibly free. But even if you're not guilty, but yes. you don't have a good lawyer, mm, you see what I'm saying? That's why people starting to be wary of, you know, how is really going on? Well, the, the, the purpose of this video was to tell you humorous stories. <laughs> That's right, and, then we're going. Um, <laughs> and um, give you some experiences and how I found Go myself. Ahead. Able to Go ahead. I'm sorry. Not to lose I'm my job. You have <laughs> so to right. I, I, I cannot Let's... opine on, on anything. I, I, you know, I could answer factual questions and my opinion means nothing um, ever since I took the bench. I can't have any political signs in my front yard. I can't wear a button. I said I can't donate to any, you know, political party or political candidates. So, um, you know, as as far as you know, um, justice, you know, uh, depending on how well you could pay your attorney. I know a lot of hardworking public defenders um, that are representing individuals um, to the best of their ability, um, and uh, you know they. They do a great job, you know. I uh, I find as many uh, cases with public defenders getting favorable outcomes as I do private attorneys or pro se defendants, people who defend, you know, defend themselves, represent themselves in court. So very good, Cas. Very good. Now let's go with those funny stories, interesting stories, because even now. Thank you, Grace. <laughs> the, the job doesn't pay a lot, but it's 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 um. It's a cool position. Um, so anyway, I, I did have an opportunity where there was this young uh, boy um, in uh, came through the courts several times, and you know each time he you know he he get away on light sentences and this and that, and then eventually he got a little older. He's 18, 19, 20 years old, and he really did have a hard luck home life. Um, you know the father left. You know there was a another man. I don't know. If it was a stepfather or just another man in, in the home. And as soon as he turned 18, they kind of showed him the door. And, you know, we tried to help him as much as we could. He was, he was a good athlete. He got a scholarship to play for um, a Division three football team as a field goal kicker. And, um, you know, he kept getting back in trouble, getting back in trouble. He lost his um, scholarship, right? So the last time he he appeared before me, he's standing there like, let's get this over with. Like he knew the system better than I did. And, and um, long story short, you know, I said, well, what are you in for? And he's like the same things, you know, drunk and disorderly or, you know, causing, causing the ruckus. So I said, all right, I'll tell you what, I'll give you, you know, you're pleading guilty. I'll give you 30 days. And he was happy. He goes, and that counts for the 30 days I've already been in there, right? I says, no, whatever you're in here for, at the end of that last, you know, uh, sentence, now my 30 days are going to start. And he couldn't believe it. He's like, uh, I'm like, I'm sorry, you've had enough chances where, you know, you should know the difference between right and wrong. You should have started on, on the path to, you know, uh, good behavior by now. And he sucked it up. He did his 30 days. Oh, about a year later, I'm sitting in my parish at the Sunday Mass, and uh, the father says, oh, we're going to have a special uh, a door collection, of, and we're going to have somebody come up from a, um, 
from a teenage outreach shelter in um, New York. Lo and behold, it's this gentleman that I gave the 30 days to, you know, gentleman 20, 21 years old. And it turns out he got uh, hooked up with this um, uh, outreach program. And he says, you know, he gave us a little 10 minute speech after mass and he's saying, you know, it's totally voluntarily, voluntary. You come in, you go, and you, if you don't want to stay, you leave. It's all up to you. It's like you're, you're not committed here, nothing. And he's, he said, you know, if, you're, if your children are having these problems, consider it. And he passed out a little pamphlet. And it was the same guy that I gave the 30 days to. And I saw him after mass and he gave me a hug and he thanked me. He goes, that was, you know, all of that was a, a great experience for him. And he turned his life around. And more importantly, he's helping others turn his life around. So when, you know, that alone was worth the price of admission for me. I felt so happy, you know, and I was happy for him. And it was just like a success story. There's another uh, thing that we do yeah, is drunk driving. Say, bravo, bravo, bravo. Because it, it's really, that's what makes a difference when you feel satisfaction, right? Yeah. Imagine if I would have given him the full six months, he could have been president by now. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Maybe he would hate you. And at this point, he learned. He obviously yeah. was yeah. enough for him to learn. Some people, you can give them five years. And then they will just uh, learn to be a better criminal in this five years in a prison. So it depends on the person, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm convinced um, nobody makes a serious change in their life until they hit rock bottom. It doesn't have to be with drugs. It doesn't have to be criminality. Like I've you know, spent half my adult life you know, fighting my weight. And it was, it's not until I have to catch my breath when I bend over to tie my shoelaces, I said, eh, you better put the brakes on. And you know, that's hitting rock bottom. And OK, so you turn around, you, you move a little, and you exercise. But everybody has to have that moment when they say, I can't go on like this. And thankfully for, the, for that young man, um, it came sooner rather than later. But sometimes it does come later. Um, you know, we do cases with drunk driving, and <laughs> I had this one gentleman, very pleasant gentleman, very nice. Um, the story that the police officer, this is going to be a long story, let me take a sip over here. Me too. The story, the story that the policeman gave when he testified said, we found Mr. So-and-so at 3 o'clock in the morning, again, everything happens at 3 a.m., at a, at a closed um, uh, gas station. And he was sleeping, you know, uh, behind the wheel and, and the police tapped on the window, no response. They had to rock the car to, to get his, he was locked in there to get his attention. He opens his eyes, looks at the cops, goes back to sleep. <laughs> he had to rock it a second time. He rolls down the window and they, they said to him, sir, do you know where you are? He looks at them, he looks at the, the surroundings, you know, you know the town, it's a small town. And he goes, yeah, right, where are you? He looks around again, I'm in New York City. <laughs> this is, the town's about eight miles away from New York City, but uh, geographically, I mean, uh, you know, the whole surroundings is like 800 miles away from New York City. So they took him in and uh, long story short, uh, we had the trial and he had a good attorney, but the facts were, were just you know, too much to, to overcome. Um, so long story short, I found them guilty. And I think the minimum we had to take the license away for seven months. And part of the, part of the, um, the, the um, penalty um, in addition to the fines is you have usually 12 hours intoxicated driver resource center. It's kind of like, a, I guess, like a, um, a mini AA, Alcoholics Anonymous, where they, they talk about why you're doing this and why is it important not to drink and drive. So, you know, that's part of the condition of getting your license back. So, fast well, forward again. But yes, there's Grace. a question. Uh, uh, you mentioned that he was drunk, sleeping in a car. Why this is a problem? Well, um, if I recall correctly from the testimony, the engine was running, number one. Also, you can be, without, without getting into too much detail, you can be found guilty 
um, if you're behind the wheel of the car um, and the keys are in ignition or it's able to be to be uh, operated. It's a whole bunch of case law uh, when you could be found guilty. They've had cases where um, they found somebody sleeping on the side of the sidewalk, um, sidewalk inside of the um, uh, highway on the, um, uh, the the right lane all the way on the right on the shoulder um, sleeping keeping with the engine running, you know, been found guilty. Um, I wasn't really prepared to go into much detail on that, but suffice it to say, if you find yourself unable to drive, say you walk out of the bar, don't sit behind the wheel, at least sit on the passenger side. Um, but there have been cases, but there's also been cases where in winter time, where the defendant had the car running to keep the heat on. Um, so, you know, it's nothing, nothing is cut and dry. But suffice it to say, when in doubt, call now it's Uber or Lyft. Uh, um, but don't without don't get being the wheel under suggestive any that maybe you're going to be driving in five minutes, let's say that you wake up and you start driving. So that's yeah. why something must be done because no police will be sitting uh, next to the car and watching when he's going to drive or he's going to sleep right. for eight hours now, now right? Yeah, the last thing they want to do is go by and say, oh, he's sleeping, you know, okay, drive on. And then they come back and he's gone. And then there's a fatal accident two miles down the road. So that's- Got um, it, got you it. Not doing yourself any favor by, you know, taking chances. So word to the wise, um, when in doubt, don't drive, don't get behind the wheel, um, call Uber, whatever, Lyft. It's it's much cheaper in the long run than getting a DWI. So getting back to our friend who thought he was in New York City instead of my hometown, I'm, I'm in an um, the emergency room at the local hospital with my godfather, you know, he, he'd fall in or something. So was, we had him in there and they were checking it out. And I, all of a sudden I hear, Judge Sunday, Judge Sunday, and I turn around, and it's the individual whose license I had taken away. And I said, oh, Mr. So-and-so, how are you? He goes, I wanted to thank you. I went to that intoxicated driver resource center and he hasn't had a drink since. And you, you see, you never know um, what can come about, you know. And that's a great You, you get lemons, make lemon light. I mean, that's, you know, you get a DWI, you stop drinking and, you know, you add a couple of good years to your life. So. And you know what? Today, I don't even know how people survive without driving. You cannot even get groceries, really, <laughs> without driving somewhere, right? It's true. It's true. It's um, it's tough. You know, that alone should be enough to have you, like, you know, have a designated driver or, um, you know, call a cab, as they say back in the old days when I was a kid, call a cab. Now it's called Uber or Lyft. So... Yeah, exactly. It's, so uh, it's, it's good. Cheaper and safer. <laughs> well, 100%. 100%. Um, you know, the, the, some of the criminal offenses we hear, the shoplifting, you know, sometimes I feel bad. You know, people, you know, get arrested for shoplifting. And, you know, um, sometimes they're, um, they're indigent. I said, oh, you know, would they, you know, what did they steal? Baby formula, some food. Food, something like that, you know, substance to, that they need to 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 get by, <laughs> was fishing lures and motor oil, <laughs> and I'm like, really, you know, you just, you know, I've given up trying to figure it out. You know, you try to you try to have some compassion, um, but you know, if, if you're going to be stealing fishing lures and motor oil, it's it is. It's weird. It is, it's actually know? weird. <laughs> it is. Which brings us to the, the best part of the job, marriages. Oh, um, yeah, marriages. <laughs> because I cannot charge for many ceremonies, I've become very popular. In fact, I uh, tease oh, my- Oh, really? Uh, you don't Please. charge for, uh, for the service? No, no. Oh. I mean, I don't have to um, perform the service outside of the court hours, but my motto is, I'll, you know, Especially if I'm going to get a free meal out of it, I'd be happy to, to go on my free <laughs> time and uh, attend the uh, <laughs> wedding ceremony. You know, now I see. understand well, so, why so, you so, say hey, somebody's getting divorced because you want that free meal. You want to feel somebody else's happiness and joy. Now, 
did you ever uh, did you ever see that uh, actually one of you know bride or groom is not happy during the ceremony? <laughs> Well, I, I, I'll tell you the, probably the, uh, one of the, the two or three most memorable ceremonies I've taken part of. One of them was at the local catering hall um, in uh, the next town over. And it's a very nice, fancy affair. And um, I woke up, they have the little back room where, you know, I hang my robe and the wedding party gets dressed and, you know, gets ready. And um, so this woman comes out in a white dress. And I'm saying to myself, no, that's not the bride. Don't look at her, it's not the bride. Judge, thank you so much for coming doing my uh, wedding ceremony. She was literally eight and a half months pregnant, which is fine, hey, it's like, you know, um, but it turns out <laughs> her, the, the soon to be husband already had two other kids together. So why they waited, you know, eight and a half months into this pregnancy for an actual ceremony, I don't know. But when we had it, she, she literally had to sit during the ceremony because she was that much with child. It was, it was, a, it was an honor and a privilege to, to be part of their wedding ceremony. Um, but the part of the line that says, and be uh, quick to forgive each other, <laughs> everybody started laughing in the audience because they obviously know that the, the two of them have such a long history together. So it was nice to, to partake in that. Um, so that was an interesting one. I wanted a, a more frightening ones uh, uh, was I had this very young Polish couple. And I say young, they must, they must be in their early, early, early 20s. And we were having an outside at the gazebo and her family was there and his family was there. And the ceremony is like, all right, repeat after me to the boy. And he, re and he says, so I so-and-so take you so-and-so to be my wedded wife. So I said, okay, I so-and-so, nothing. Well, maybe you didn't understand me. I, so and so, I, you know, not to whatever his name. Again, nothing. And I said, oh my God, this kid's going to run out on her. And the first thing I think of is, what am I going to do? And I said, eh, this bride ain't my daughter. <laughs> There's no relative of mine. Just stand out of the way. If, the, if the, the bride's father wants to tackle him on the way out, that's between the two of them. So the third time I said, okay, I, so and so. And he found us, I, Janusz, or whatever the name was. Take you. No English. You couldn't repeat it, right? No. He spoke perfect English. So I said, okay, we muddle through the ceremony, and his eyes are red. Ceremony's over, and he apologized. He goes, I'm sorry. I was just so happy to be marrying my wife. I couldn't speak. And I'm saying to myself, kid, you're good. This marriage is going to last a long time because that was a great answer. <laughs> <laughs> so it, I'm sure he was overcome with emotion. So what to expect? And I'm like, so that was that was a good one. And Did you ever you know, see that somebody actually walked away, or in the last second said, "When everything looks so good, everybody prepared, you know, blah blah," and then somebody says, "One of them, groom or bride, no." No, thankfully, I've never had that experience. Um, again, as long as it's not my relations, <laughs> it's like, <laughs> do what you want, you know, uh, as opposed to cursing me for the rest of your life uh, for marrying me. You, you know, know what? But I'm saying this because I just watched a couple of days ago a video, a true video, mm -hmm. that the guy knew that the bride-to-be was cheating on him with his best friend. So he didn't say anything. The whole thing now, probably her par parents, you know, paid for the wedding. So they all, you know, here we have, I think this was a priest. And she said, yes, everything is fine. And then they comes to him and, she, and he says, no. And he says, look, all of you, what is under the chairs? And there were pictures of her sleeping with somebody else. You should see the bride's face. Oh my God. <laughs> wow. So anything can happen. I'm sure anything has happened. You know, yeah. I'm sure that's not the first time that occurred, uh, um, you know, in the wedding ceremony. But um, you, you asked me, do they look happy sometimes? Do they not look happy? 
I'll be honest with you, you know, uh, with an immigrant community that I, I service, uh, you know, um, sometimes, you know, is it for love or for papers, documents, money? <laughs> I don't want to say a green card, but sometimes you have to suspect. There was this, this one, and it, it's an uh, urban legend in my court. And um, so I'm saying the, the husband repeats after me, and then the wife repeat. you know, then it's the wife's turn. I, you know, uh, woman take you, man, to be my... So sometimes English is a second or third language. So now look at me. And kind of look at my math, how I'm, you know, mathing the words, and so they could say it properly. This and that. So she said, "I love, honor, and respect you." Of their days of my life, and all of a sudden, out of the, the groom, I hear, "Look at me!" <laughs> instead, instead of looking at the judge when she's given to look at the thing, and then all of a sudden, I took my ceremony, and I'm like, oh, "Okay, you know, uh, yeah, look at him, whatever he says." But um, it was funny. So. Now, when I do my wedding ceremony, um, if uh, you're after me, <laughs> but to this day, like it, you, know, you ask my court staff, look at me, and everybody breaks up laughing. It's, um, it is what it is. I'm telling you, you can't, you can't make this stuff up, but uh, it's a and lot of fun. You can never predict what's going to happen. Like uh, and that's why I never, that's why I never do. Um, it was one time, you know, you have to do the. Um, fill out the light, you're not supposed to fill out the license totally, like the location and the, who's performing it. I fill that out, so, or my staff does. Well, this one time before court, they put the wrong town in. They put the town that they were living in instead of the town I was the judge in. So to make it legal, we had to run out of court before it started, go the next town over to Clifton, and it was right by Botany Village, they have a little fountain there i am in my robe with the you know the two witnesses and the the, the bride and groom doing you know taking the vows i'm like ah what a <laughs> what a way to earn a living so surprisingly the most contested um matters i hear are parking offenses street sweepers no parking whatever fire zones and these poor and, people um, don't have a space to park especially when it's winter time, right? Now, but this yes. is a question for you. Now I sure. see everywhere, this is not just your town, anywhere that is a problem with the parking on the street. I see the chairs, the garbage cans. Is this legal? I, you know, now that you say that, that reminds me of another story. I was in another <laughs> town. No, was I in another? I think I was in another town and the lady got a, a parking ticket because um, it was a you know alternate side and it was a snowstorm and um, they uh, she got a ticket and she complained well my neighbor put a garbage can in front of the next spot in front of me they didn't get a ticket why didn't they get a ticket so I looked at her and I said did that garbage man have a license plate on it uh, no well, that's why they didn't get a ticket. <laughs> and she was satisfied with the answer. I'm like, they, you know, theoretically, the town could come up and just pick that all, all that stuff up, the lawn chairs, the garbage cans, throw it in the, in the dump truck and drive away with it. Because, you, you know, you're really not allowed to, you know, claim your spot as, as it were. But, but I that, think that reminds me of two more stories. Yeah, but you know what? People probably don't bother because first of all, it's a neighbor, and next of all, you don't know if your tire will be okay after that. Possible. It's you possible. Know, you we handle those cases too. <laughs> you see? I'll never get. <laughs> I've been driving in my hometown since I was 17. I never got a parking ticket. Well, I get on a bench, and my dad was in failing health at that time, and it was on a Wednesday. And I, so I come to pick him up to take him to the doctor. And I says, oh, God, you know, the high school, I live near the high school. And I'm like, parking is always tough during school days. And I pull right in. And I'm like, oh, thank you, God. This is perfect. Not a, not a, a car on the street. I pull right in front of my house. I walk up the stairs, get my dad. And I'm walking him down the stairs. Now, now mind you, this took all of three minutes. I come out, and there's a parking ticket on my car. <laughs> the reason there was no cars in front of my house was it was a street sweeper. It was that alternate uh, 
the, the side. So I says, oh, I laughed. I said, oh, okay. And I paid the $30, you know. Um, fast forward a couple months later, it's a snowstorm. And um, my godfather lives on one side of um, the street and my grandmother lived on the other side of the street and the houses were still in the family. So I go there and I pull up with my snow shovel. I dig my godfather's uh, house out on the left side, cross the street, digging my grandmother's house out on the right side. I'm walking back to my car, and who do you think standing there? An Police. officer <laughs> writing out a ticket. And now I know why people get annoyed for getting tickets in a snowstorm. And it just finished, like, must have had about six or seven inches. And he's standing there writing out a ticket. He looks at me, I look at him, and then he doesn't recognize me, right? He starts writing, and then he stops. He, he looks at me, he goes, Oh, uh, uh, I said, Give me the ticket. He goes, oh, well, no. I said, give me the ticket for $30. I'm not going to risk my job. In fact, um, you know, a lot of times I'll get an uncle that comes in and say, I got this stupid ticket. What am I supposed to do with it? I didn't want to tell him. I said, I'll take care of it. <clears throat> and of course, I paid for it. So I told my dad, he goes, let me tell you something. The first two jobs, the first two years he was on a job as a cop, he's paid for more parking tickets than he did anything else. Half his pay went to his friends and relatives' parking tickets. So, um, no, there's no special, uh, you know, uh, get out of parking jail free passes. But I got to tell you this one last story regarding parking offenses. You know, everybody wants to fight the parking offense. And, you know, I hear it by myself. I don't have to have the cop present. And so it's just like I put the person under oath. <clears throat> Excuse me. I put the person under oath. I said, tell me your story. Well, there was no sign there. I got this ticket, there's no street signs. I looked this way, I looked that way, and they show me pictures, but the pictures are like so cropped where like they don't really, they cut off like two thirds of the streets. Like you can see a sign like so far in the distance. I looked at this one particular picture and it says, does this accurately represents the way your car was parked at the time? And she says, yes, okay. And you took this picture, yes. And this is that's your car, yes. And that's where it was parked. And I said, do me a favor, look past your car on the fence. What does that sign say? She looks and goes, uh, never mind. Big sign, no parking anytime. And it was right next to her car. And it was like, uh, you know, I'm like, uh, okay, twenty dollar fine, ten dollar court plus. Step outside, pay it to a known your name. Oh, I, it was I'm, it was fun. It was like she got a kick out of. You know what? It reminds me of some funny story. Since we're talking about funny stories, right? Some woman is driving, and suddenly she sees a sign that is only for the deer. You know, like the deer sign. Oh yeah. And deer she crossing. Understood, she understood she cannot drive there. It's only for the deer. <laughs> Talking about funny stories, you never yeah. know what may happen. That's almost as bad when I was in, a kid, we were in Miami Beach for a vacation in August with the family. So I'm walking, I've, you know, I, I, I've never seen a don't walk signs, you know, when I was growing up. So we're in the middle of the city and we're walking in the, um, on the crosswalk. I get halfway through and all of a sudden the thing starts flashing, don't walk. So I stop. And my, my parents continue walking to the other side. They look at me. <laughs> my dad had to come around, hang out, grab me by the shirt and pull me. I was like, what are you doing? It's like, you know, sign said, don't walk. He goes, no, that's like, if you're not off the curb yet, don't don't come. So, but I was, I was just a youngster then, much smarter now. Yeah, you know, I tell you, anything goes, really anything goes. That's why when we have comedies, that's the life stories. Yeah. But just it's, funny, it, you know. <laughs> the funniest stories are the true ones. Like you can't make this exactly. up. Exactly. You you couldn't even come up with this. You know what I'm saying? Because yeah. in your perception or my would be like that's impossible. Yeah. Oh yes. <laughs> Whatever you think is impossible, yeah. yes it is. So what's Absolutely. the that's what's the last the funniest story. <laughs> <laughs> that was that. Yes, that was. <laughs> I saved the best for like I when I used to teach over at the, an adjunct uh, professor. I used to tell my students like everything I'm going to tell you is true, and I said ninety percent of the time I'm going to be the butt of my own jokes. 
but that leaves 10% of the time I'm going to be teasing you. But um, so that was a pretty good one. Like, don't walk. And uh, my dad had to come rescue me in the middle of the intersection. Yeah, yeah. It's so interesting. You were a teacher, right? I don't know if you're still teaching in a university, college summer, right? Um, no, I, um, I used to teach for about nine years or so years, adjunct professor. I used to teach some uh, law classes, some accounting classes, some um, of what you'd call it philosophy classes. And you know what? Um, it's a, but it's I, a, I taught a, a good smattering of, of course, and I really enjoyed it. Actually, but, being a teacher, it teaches you a lot. Yeah, it's a great experience for both sides. You know what I mean? You I, I love learn something. And you the, love teaching. If I had one, uh, was that? And you love teaching. I remember you saying, I love teaching. I said, um, my alma mater had an opening uh, for a full-time faculty, not professional, not, um, not for a tenure track, just to like be an adjunct, you know, the full, full time. Had I gotten that position, I think I would have given everything up and move there, um, you know, I still would have lived in my town, but I'd go up there for like three or four days a week, get a place and teach. Um, the loss was the universities because I was gonna do it for a dollar a year just to, just to do it, but that's- Dollar a year, oh my God, the gas costs a lot more. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm kind of generous to my own mom. I think it's a great you know job. something you know something i think we're gonna be finishing you know why because mm -hmm. you're freezing more often and i hope it's not gonna be showing later because we're talking on zoom and on youtube it's gonna be fine but this freezing was you know was many uh, so i pray <laughs> i pray now no, we can always do it again Maybe I'll come up with better stories or happier endings. Uh, you know what? Uh, uh, your internet good. connection is unstable. Yeah, they, they all good stories. I love this kind of stories because it teaches us, it make, makes us laugh, and shows that anything is possible. Anything goes. <laughs> I, I agree. Learn something for sure. So I thank you so much for your time, for your energy, for preparing the stories, for sharing with us your wisdom from the bench. I, so. I, I, I've, uh, I've always enjoyed it. I thank, thank you for the opportunity uh, because if I had to rely on myself to figure out how to put something on YouTube, I, I could barely answer the phone on my cell phone. Oh, <laughs> so. well, that's why you see people know people and cooperation is really mm -hmm. important, especially now in these times when we don't meet, don't shake hands, don't do this, don't do that, don't do anything. Mm -hmm. So uh, thank God for the internet and connecting this way. I agree, very good. Always a pleasure, Grace. Mm -hmm. I, hope, I hope you and your uh, viewers have a, help, um, have a happy Christmas, a, a healthy new year, and uh, next year we'll do it without masks on. That's right. Merry Christmas, happy new year, and enjoy whatever, every single day, every single moment. Like I always say, carpe diem, seize the moment, because you never know what's going to be next. And that's why we made today uh, possible to laugh. You know, laughter is a really great medicine. So we need it more than anywhere, anytime uh, in the past, right? Just to love yeah. and enjoy and connect with people and help each other. It's, Serve others. That's right, help others. Remember, you're not the only one, okay? It's more people around us. So everybody, cars, and thank you very much, appreciate it. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.